Well, hello everyone and welcome. Uh, I'm Tom Wheeler and I will be the moderator of today's webinar. Um, the topic today is the regulation of big tech. Um, and it's a particularly uh, timely topic for us today when you stop and consider the uh, recent report of the House Antitrust Subcommittee, uh, the rumored uh, Google antitrust suit, which the Department of Justice may be dropping um, this week. Um, and because of a new study published at the Shorenstein Center um, called New uh, Digital Realities, New Oversight Solutions by Phil Verveer, Gene Kimmelman, um, and myself. Um, today, we will have the authors of that paper, uh, as well as two distinguished thought leaders um, on the topic. Um, I'll introduce everybody in, in a moment, but first, uh, some housekeeping and ground rules as to what we might um, expect um, today. Um, we will begin with five-minute comments by uh, each of the four panelists. Um, and then uh, turn to you in the audience for your questions and engage in discussion amongst all of us panelists um, about those questions, although feel free to identify a specific person you'd like the, the uh, question addressed to. If you'll use the Q&A button, um, the chat button uh, on, uh, on your screen, um, I will see the uh, questions and then I will ask uh, the appropriate uh, panelists. But we plan to spend essentially the last half of our time uh, together doing this. So without uh, further ado, let me go straight to um, our participants today and um, introduce them in order of their appearance. First up will be Jason Firmer. Firmer. Jason Furman. <laughs> Get my, hey, thanks, Ryan. It's, it's the new teeth, Jason. Uh, uh, Jason Furman, who is the, um, the author of the definitive report <laughs> for the UK's uh, Competition and Markets Authority on digital advertising platforms that in so many ways was um, a predicate. Uh, to the work um, that we did at, at Shorenstein's um, Center. Uh, Jason is a professor of economics, both in the economics department uh, and at Harvard Kennedy School. And of course, he is the former chairman of President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors. Jason will be followed by Phil Verveer, uh, who was co-author of the Shorenstein paper and a senior fellow um, at the Shorenstein Center. Phil has had a distinguished career in and out uh, of government. He's the former U.S. Ambassador for International Communications and Information Policy. He has had multiple um, leadership roles at the Federal Communications Commission over the years. And he has the distinction of being the man whose signature is on the initial filing that was the lawsuit that ended up breaking up AT&T. He was the initial lead attorney um, on, on that Department of Justice uh, action. Next up will be Mignon Clyburn, um, a, a lady with vast regulatory uh, experience. Um, for 11 years, Mignon was a member of the South Carolina uh, Public Service Commission. Um, for nine years, she was a commissioner at the Federal Communications Commission, including uh, a period as she, when she was the acting uh, chairwoman of the FCC, um, a, a, uh, a designation that is normally a placekeeping uh, position, but Mignon turned into an activist uh, position, uh, bringing out of uh, 
hibernation items that had been ignored for far too long and providing some real leadership. She is a businesswoman uh, and a newspaper publisher before she got into public service. Uh, and we're grateful to have you with us today, Mignon. And then batting cleanup is going to be Jean Kimmelman, who is um, uh, another one of the co-authors of the uh, paper and another senior fellow at the Shorenstein Center at Harvard Kennedy School. Jean is one of America's foremost consumer protection advocates. Uh, he has uh, made antitrust his specialty. Uh, he was counsel to the Senate Antitrust uh, Subcommittee. Uh, he was a, a senior staff in the uh, Department of Justice um, uh, Antitrust uh, Division, and he's recently retired as the CEO of Public Knowledge, um, one of the um, leading lights in public interest advocacy in the area of technology and telecommunications. So that's the lineup. Uh, to my fellow panelists, uh, we won't do uh, introductions uh, between you all. So when Jason finishes, Phil, you can just step right up and, and start in and, um, and we'll go from there until we start getting some questions uh, after we've done a full round. So Jason, thank you very much for being with us. Great. It's great to be with you. I think uh, your report is just terrific. I think it is the definitive roadmap for um, where we should be going as a country. Just stepping back, you know, is there a problem here? The tech giants are giant in part because they make good products that people like and benefit from lots of other people using them at the same time, network externalities. That's all true, and I think we don't want to get in the way of that. But they're also big because they figured out how to take their bigness in one area, leverage it into another area, um, and use that bigness to self-perpetuate itself. We often distinguish between organic growth, you know, a company's successful and it just keeps growing and growing and growing, which is presumptively a good thing, even if it comes with some risks, and growth by merger and acquisition. And the tech companies, again, are a bit of both. Partly it's organic growth, but there's lots and lots of mergers. And they're not just aqua hires. Many of them are aqua hires, you know, small company or trying to get the personnel. But some of them are like the main other social network. Now there's three of them that are combined under the heading of um, one company. So I think there are good things here you don't want to mess up. And there are bad things here um, that you need to improve on. And so doing nothing is not an option. Coming in with a sledgehammer is not an option. To me, our guiding principle should be, what can we do to get more competition? What type of competition? Every type. Potential competition, make it easier for new ones to enter, make it easier for users to use multiple systems simultaneously, make it easier for users to switch. All of this um, we need to do. Antitrust within the current paradigm could do more in that regard. The Justice Department and the Antitrust Division could block more mergers, but there's a real constraint in the court system um, where they might block a merger and the courts would overrule that blocking and allow it to proceed. The government can bring antitrust cases and I have no problem with that. And in fact, in some cases that may well be warranted, but it has a limit as a solution to the problem because antitrust cases take a really long time. They can take more than a decade sometimes. At the end of it, um, you have a remedy that is very specific to that particular matter. And in the rapid technological evolution that we have um, in the digital sector, that's especially a problem. It can just be too late by the time antitrust gets around to it. Um, that's why you know, we're overdue for um, a pro-competition regulator that's all about facilitating entry, clarifying what the rules of the road are so it's more predictable and the companies have less uncertainty than they have in the slot machine uh, that they face now in the courts. That is all about giving consumers more choices and better products with more ability to move from one to the other um, and the like. You know, this, it's very important the regulation be pro-competitive. So it apply you know, to the big ones. If I want to set up 
you know, Jason Furman's search engine. And all Jason Furman's search engine does is redirect you to my own website so you can read all the great things I've written. Um, I should be allowed to do that. I don't think that search engine would get very far in the marketplace, um, but I'm a tiny little bit player in the whole thing. Um, let me do that. If Google wants to do that as far and away the dominant search engine, um, that is a much, uh, much bigger uh, problem. And by having the enforcement be, you know, this isn't human rights. Um, if you're talking about privacy, large and small companies need to protect your privacy. If you're talking about competition, the rules need to apply to large companies. They don't need to apply to small companies. That's another way to continue to ensure um, we have innovation and dynamism. Um, I think the alternative to something like this um, would be something either doing nothing um, which would allow us to drift and allow the problems to fester or doing something much more radical. I think this is the better solution that could result in more of what consumers want, whether that's privacy, more innovative products, products being effectively priced better, um, whether that's in terms of you know, the advertising markups or all the other different ways that you already are paying for the products that are ostensibly free. Phil. Well, we, um, in, in working on our report, had put ourselves in good company because it had um, largely coincided with the good work Jason had done in the United Kingdom. Uh, and uh, in terms of uh, perspective on antitrust, it turns out that we're in exactly the same place that Jason just, uh, uh, just has outlined. Um, antitrust is certainly necessary, but our view is in terms of the major uh, digital platforms, it's not sufficient. Uh, and there are three concerns, uh, which Jason has just touched on. Um, antitrust is too slow to resolution in a dynamic environment. Um, if you think about the, the two major section two cases the government has brought uh, in living memory, um, one, the AT&T case took seven and a half years from complaint to settlement. It was preceded by more than a year of investigation, and it was followed by two years of planning prior to the divestiture. Um, in the case of Microsoft, uh, the case took two years from the complaint to the uh, initial uh, decree, but um, it was followed by two and a half years of appeals before we got to a final decree. And the case itself, the complaint was preceded by about eight years of activity involving the Department of Justice and the FTC vis-a-vis uh, -vis Microsoft. And more recently, we've seen Ohio against Amex, a case very important in terms of two-sided two markets that began in 2010 and was decided by the Supreme Court in 2018. And uh, contemporaneously, a very important case involving Qualcomm uh, brought by the FTC that is approaching its fourth year now subject to a non-bank uh, petition in the Ninth Circuit. So there's just simply no basis for quarreling with the idea that these things take a very long time and in this kind of uh, an environment, they probably take too long. Um, second, um, there are litigation uncertainties. Um, now litigation is always uncertain. That's why most litigation is settled rather than goes to a final judgment. Um, but here, in the case of antitrust, that's compounded by the reality that over the last 40 years, a, a perspective that is non-interventionist, associated with the Chicago School principally, um, has come to predominate antitrust uh, interpretations. And um, that view is almost certainly held by the majority of the uh, justices of the Supreme Court, uh, which is where unless there's legislation, the law is made. Uh, we've seen a, a, a very large debate about this break out, that is the interpret, proper interpretation of the antitrust laws, break out in the last very few years between the traditional Chicago school view and what sometimes are called Brandeisians or reformers of one sort or another and the recent uh, House uh, uh, Judicial Antitrust Committee report is a, a pretty good indication of the the views of the critics of the, uh, the now prevailing school. Nevertheless, again, um, litigation uncertainties would, would be uh, absolutely inherent in terms of any effort to bring antitrust as the principal or only mechanism 
uh, to deal with platform concerns. And then last, you have the point that, again, Jason has just spoken to uh, uh, very, very ably. Um, it is trying to figure out a remedy that you're confident uh, can be uh, more beneficial than not. Um, and that, in this kind of an environment, um, is a very, very large challenge for antitrust courts. Um, trying to calculate benefits and costs are going to be difficult in any event, but especially if there are conduct-related aspects to the thing. The question is, how would a court monitor, construe, and ultimately enforce something that has many moving parts and ongoing responsibilities? Um, and um, that problem is one of the <coughs> apparent. So three problems, time to resolution, uncertainty in terms of resolution, and assuming a finding of liability, what kind of remedy uh, would turn out to be suitable? For those reasons, we think more than antitrust it was going to be required. So Mignon, what, what we propose then um, is that there be a new digital protection agency that works in conjunction with antitrust, as Phil has just discussed, but creates a new regulatory structure with its own DNA, if you will, digital DNA. Um, and you, you know, have a 20-year career um, in, uh, in, in regulation. Uh, and uh, tell us about your reaction. Well, again, I want to thank you for allowing me to be a part of this distinguished panel. Um, uh, if I told my mom um, I was hanging out with some folk at Harvard, she would go, yes, right. Um, but this is an incredible uh, opportunity to share, uh, as you mentioned, more than a year or two of background and observation and uh, participation in this. So I had this prepared text and I'll uh, it, it, uh, wind it up by saying this, um, not yet, uh, not now. Uh, and uh, I say that uh, because of a number of questions I have. Look, let me start by saying something that might surprise you. I agree with a lot of what is said in this, uh, this, uh, in this uh, discussion paper. I agree with a lot of, uh, let's just call them the Furman papers, because I think it sounds real cool to say that. Um, uh, that uh, I, again, from a person who spent 19 years of her life, uh, attempting to make that balance when it comes to consumers, as well as uh, the responsibility I had as an economic regulator, because I considered myself that type of, of regulator uh, that was responsible uh, for uh, balancing uh, the needs of uh, critical uh, industries, um, as well as the needs of those who use the services. Um, I am always going to attempt to exhaust uh, what I think are the possible uh, uh, remedies to a, a problem that we have. We are talking about, and I will admit this, no matter what the title or what the client, I will admit that there are concerns uh, that, we, that need to be addressed. There are vulnerabilities uh, here. Uh, one of the great things that we can brag on, um, and rightly so when it comes to uh, these uh, platforms and services, is that it has leveled the playing field for millions. Consumers, businesses, large and small, advertisers, those voices that for literally hundreds of years that have gone unheard, and uh, those people who have been unseen, they are no longer invisible. And that in, in of itself is an earthly miracle. It really is. And it is something uh, that uh, we should always be mindful, uh, no matter how well intentioned we are. Uh, I, I can sum it all up by saying, I'll leave more for our Q and A and exchange, is that I truly believe that this is a phenomenal down payment um, 1.0 on a series of other questions that no doubt uh, a majority of, of people have. Number one, um, you know, to me is always going to be the inclusion factor. Who else is that at the table uh, with these discussions? What other considerations are we taking into account? Because no one um, who has uh, been enabled, and I got that from you, Tom, been enabled by these opportunities 
uh, enabled by these companies, uh, enabled to not have to have a storefront um, or to, to advertise in the traditional ways that might have been economically out of reach. No one should be disadvantaged. The next series of steps, including steps and in opportunities for protection, they must be weighed those pros and cons, you know, the, those, uh, those checks and balances, those, all of those have to uh, go, uh, must be in, uh, taken into account before we go to what I think is, if I were to look at a scale from zero to 60, uh, the establishment of a digital platform a agency to me is 60. It, it, it really, it, it is something that we need to look at. It is something that rightly uh, needs to uh, be, you know, be probed. Um, you've asked a lot of uh, probing questions. Um, and today's, in today's uh, tech environment, um, we are forced uh, to answer and address uh, these important uh, questions. Uh, uh, but um, one of the challenges, one of the things when I ask about these series of trade-offs um, that um, we uh, undoubtedly will make and, and those questions that need to be addressed is what company is not a digital company? And especially in a COVID environment, what company is this not applicable? Um, and, and so, you know, from, from where I sit, um, uh, again, the right questions, uh, the right approaches, um, but you know, how would the agency deal with companies that engage in digital markets that are under the jurisdiction of another agency? Uh, you know, agricultural firms, transportation companies, financial services, healthcare, retail. Um, how much or, or can the um, FCC or why can't the FTC uh, handle digital? If there are um, issues there, are there issues at the uh, other agencies? Um, are there remedies? Um, you know, legislative remedies or application and interpretation uh, remedies that we need uh, to um, look at before. So I will sum it up uh, by saying that um, the there is there. The reasoning is sound. The, the, the questions are, are valid. But what is being proposed in the paper to take up to four years best case scenario uh, uh, to, to, to implement, to execute, uh, and to get shored up. And in the meantime, that is a lot uh, of um, you know, time that would have lapsed. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of things that um, I am hoping that uh, as we continue to talk and engage, that we will walk and chew gum at the same time we will look for opportunities to better address the vulnerabilities uh, that are apparent, uh, any harms uh, that are anticipated or take place. And yes, um, whatever we could do to address the regulatory lag issue, we must. Are there interim, um, you know, in the, in the Furman papers, he talks about interim, um, you know, remedies. Those are the types of conversations we must have. Um, but I, I will say that um, I am, uh, again, glad to be a part of the discussion. Uh, do not um, take issue with the premise. Um, but as a non-doctor, I will say the prescription at this point, I think, is premature. Thank you. Well, I guess we don't put you down as undecided, Mignon. Um, the, um so before we go to Gene, um, I just want to remind everybody that you can go to the Q&A button on your screen. We've got a couple of good, uh, several good uh, questions teed up here that I'll go to um, in a minute. But uh, please, uh, to the audience, feel free to add your uh, thoughts and, and questions. Gene Kimmelman. Thank you, Tom. Um, Mignon, I think that we all really agree with you. And I learned a long time ago to do everything I could to avoid disagreeing with someone who is so attuned with the people as you are. So let me explain why I think we're actually not going to 60. Uh, we're going to 10 or 20 and we're, go we're actually pacing it much more closely to what you suggested. Um, the, uh, the idea of putting a, a proposal out there emanates from what you've heard before. 
the amazing length of time and uncertainty of antitrust. Imagine if the Justice Department files a suit against Google in the near future. Imagine the Federal Trade Commission files a suit against Facebook in the near future. Uh, are we all gonna just wipe our hands and say, let's wait and see what happens? That could easily be five to seven years. Um, what we suggest is, and we don't know what the result of those cases would be. It could come out in, in a very disappointing way given where the jurisprudence is. We suggest, let's not sit on our hands. Let's move forward and think about what it takes to make these markets more competitive. Jason laid out all the factors. I mean, I think all the factors Jason laid out, starting with only regulating large companies, um, actually lead to the kind of inclusion and opportunities and voices for marginalized communities that is what made the internet as good as it is. It only restrains monopolists or those with bottleneck gatekeeper control that are holding out those who need to be uplifted and brought in. That's the goal. The question is whether we can do that well. What we know is we need careful calibrated tools because again, as everyone has indicated, um, you need to balance the benefits of what even the largest companies offer and the opportunities for innovation, the opportunities for quality improvements, the opportunities for better pricing that are lost if they are putting their thumb on the scale against the smaller players, against the new entrants. That's what we're trying to design. Uh, we did this with the cable industry and it was Congress and it took a number of years, but instead of just waiting for antitrust cases, we challenged monopolistic pricing, we challenged limitations against the satellite companies entering the market. And um, the Cable Act opened up opportunities uh, for content providers uh, of color, for smaller independent players. Um, and it's things like that that we're looking to do here. We raise it now too because every other sector of the US economy has a sector specific regulator, not just antitrust. Banks have numerous agencies overseeing them. We have the SEC, we have the Ag Department, we have the FCC for telecommunications and internet service providers, um, HHS, on down the line. In the tech sector, the FTC only has limited authority over privacy, consumer protection, alongside antitrust. So we suggest preserving antitrust, we suggest, uh, in response to Mignon's question, leaving the jurisdiction of every other agency, Ag Department, um, uh, FCC, other FTC authorities in place. And the digital regulatory agency is only there to fill the gaps where no one is regulating, no one is empowered to regulate, and only focus on dominant digital platforms. So Mignon, we're trying to thread the needle and um, I think we're also trying to do this in a paced way that fits with uh, one fundamental fact about US policymaking. By not having an agency, we don't have a committee to go to in Congress to lodge complaints that aren't directly antitrust complaints. We don't have a focal point for dealing with complaints from small industry players, from those trying to enter markets, again, those trying to challenge the big incumbents. Um, we need to build a conversation with Congress, and we think the way to do it is to propose what are the functions that are needed to fill the gaps where there is no public accountability? What are the best tools that could be applied to that to do what Jason describes, not use a sledgehammer, but something more like a scalpel, careful interventions uh, to maximize innovation and opportunities across the economy? Um, and then, once you figure out what the functions are and what the tools are, we ask the question, is there anywhere in government where people have those skills, have the experience, have shown, demonstrated that they can do this kind of work? We don't see it, but we're open to that conversation because if there is some place where those skills have been hidden, they've been held back, uh, we ought to know that. But you can't do it without putting out an idea and, and testing the waters. So I think we're trying to be approximately where you were suggesting, Mignon. And if we've missed the mark, uh, we'll go back and rework it. So we have done the, thank you to everybody. You have done the impossible, the 
I think amongst us we doubted would be achievable, and that is that <laughs> we have actually constrained ourselves to the first 30 minutes to leave a meaningful 30 minutes for questioners. And, and there are some excellent questions, and I'm going to start off uh, with one from Art Brodsky, uh, a longtime observer and, and commenter on things uh, regulatory, and, and, and direct this um, uh, to Phil and then ask Jason to fill in behind that. Uh, Art Brodsky asks, why would any action or proceeding initiated by your new agency proceed any faster than what is used today? Certainly, any company that is the subject of an action will bring all its legal and lobbying power to bear with your new agency as they do now. Phil? Well, uh, Art, first, it's good to uh, hear from you, even uh, through the intermediation of our friend Tom. Uh, I think that. Um, the, the best answer to that is we've tried in terms of the outline of the regulatory design to create something that has some time limits built in and the sort of short version of a long story is a kind of standards making process that is time limited that is back ended through, with uh, some ability on the part of the agency to engage in APA uh, Administrative Procedure Act uh, activities. Uh, so while there's no doubt that there'd be intense uh, uh, lobbying, intense uh, uh, activities associated with this, we're hopeful that this would be something that would move more swiftly and more surely than uh, would uh, at least a conventional section two monopolization case using the antitrust laws, which, um, as we point out at the moment, may be about the only implement that's available if you feel that uh, something is amiss in terms of uh, in terms of the com workably competitive environment uh, with digital. So Jason, how did you deal with I, that when you heard this complaint? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, first of all, nothing slower than section two monopolization cases. Um, second, where things tend to get bogged down in litigation is where the statutory authority for doing something has a certain amount of ambiguity. Um, in it. Um, both Tom and Minyan have some experience with this because it's not like Congress said do exactly net neutrality open internet. They said some other stuff and the FCC was reading into that, um, you know, maybe very reasonably so, but it was not explicit 100% clear in the statute. Something like that leads to a lot of litigation. If you set something up and it's clear what it's supposed to do, what its mission is, and it's following through on that mission, that greatly reduces um, all that litigation. Last thing I'd say is I hear from the companies that you know we don't mind staying on this side of the line. We just don't, what we don't like is when we don't know where the line is. Line Tell is. us where the line is and we'll stay on that side of the line. And a lot of the goal here is to be much clearer about that in advance. Everyone that knows what it is, everyone can stay on that side of the line. So I don't even know that this would be met with furious, no holds barred um, litigation so much as, um, you know, with compliance. So Gene, walk us through the agile regulatory structure that we have proposed in part to deal with precisely the question that Art asks. Well, so I think point one is, um, if you start with an existing agency, it has a culture, it has a history, it has a lot of good, um, uh, hardworking people who do things in a certain way. And it turns out that that way tends to be quite slow. So where we want to start with is, um, is there a way to bring in people who are uh, more attuned to the fast paced life of Silicon Valley and digital markets? and how algorithms are adjusted constantly, but are driving all the big data gathering and uh, market machinations that it leads to and all the advertising revenue. We need those kind of people in there. We don't see that in government today. So we need um, a lot of new kinds of skills brought together in a process, uh, number one. Number two, we thought 
there is an awful lot of know-how among the players in the industry who are challenging the incumbents, who say they're not being treated fairly. And instead of just going to court and complaining, um, we thought bringing them together in some way of trying to create um, opportunities and incentives to develop standards and norms for the industry, uh, um, uh, rules of the road that don't require rulemaking would be preferable than having to go through a lengthy process. Will that work? Well, nothing will happen just collaboratively. We know this is a competitive marketplace, so you need the stick of a regulator over it. So the idea of using rulemaking as a fallback, using rulemaking with people with the skills from the tech sector to monitor whether you can develop things through standards, um, uh, we thought was the right balance here. Um, incentives to cooperate, but um, a stick to intervene. And uh, we can't guarantee that it will work better than every other agency that's been established. But we thought the goal here should be to create um, um, a high bar for the government to function in a way that actually suits the design of how the digital marketplace works. Be quick, be nimble, and be fair. Uh, it's a great answer, Gene. And I think the other thing is is that we we said how do we how do we change from the traditional way of running an administrative proceeding? And the model that we kept looking to and became self obvious is code establishment. You know the the establishment of building codes and electric codes and there's codes for everything is a joint private sector, public sector activity that has built into it both speed and agility. So let me go to a question and ask you, Mignon, direct this question to you. This is from um, Isabel Schunemann, who asks, more consumer choice sounds great, but unless users are properly informed about the consequences of their product choice, I wonder whether there will be a more dynamic market. Is there any additional regulation that the panel considers necessary to create more competition? For example, better transparency on advertising and privacy. And I guess I would direct that to, to you, Mignon, on, in the sense of are there steps that can be taken in the kind of areas that Isabel identifies that preclude the need for an agency and support your kind of position? I absolutely uh, say embedded in her question uh, is, are, are, are partials to uh, the answer. Um, one of the things I, I chuckle um, about um, going into a private industry, one of the persons I first talked to said, we want you, you know, uh, we're trying to get, um, you know, a comprehensive, um, you know, well-intentioned, you know, a, you know, privacy, uh, you know, regulations or laws into place. Still waiting, by the way. Um, you know, and so my thing is, uh, the answer is yes. Um, I, I just really think with better cues from Congress, uh, with, uh, with uh, changes in a, a, attention to the current construct, with, um, uh, with transparency uh, in mind, that has to be front of mind with a consumer interest and a necessary backstop in mind, uh, with that innovation and recalibration within agencies. Look, um, the, the, the part of, I'm not pushing back on you know, the reasoning I'm, I'm pushing back a bit on, um, a, again, you know, the remedy, because newsflash, what you are proposing is the establishment of another agency, um, which uh, could, and over time, and it might not take that long, take on a life of its own. And, um, you know, the, the, the question is, um, at, at the end of the day, um, if this is the most efficient and effective and quickest way uh, to do something. Um, I do not think um, uh, that uh, we have exhausted uh, you know, um, possible other directions and remedies. Um, I, I just don't think we have given it a chance. So the answer is yes. I think it is by challenging and um, shoring up and firming up, uh, firming, the eye, um, you know, firming up, um, you know, the, the current constructs 
And so, yes, I, I really think, uh, you know, with, with the desire uh, and, and with the direction and the mandate that everyone takes seriously, uh, that we would, um, uh, again, uh, enable more uh, dynamism and, and, and enable more opportunity and alike. Um, I, I, I think we should, regardless of what happens um, here, I think that's the direction we should all be a part of Agents for Change um, in moving Congress and the, the agencies to move in that direction. So Mignon, so Tiago Prado, um, I think would probably agree with you. And his question is, whoops, his question just got bounced out. Here we go. His question is, assuming that regulation is needed for digital platforms, and considering that the FCC has all the skills and experience with economic regulation and enforcement, why would creating a new, he says it in capital letters, a new agency be better than just empowering the FCC to also deal with digital platforms regulation? And let's broaden that beyond the FCC to talk about generically uh, existing federal agencies, FCC, FTC, et cetera. Mignon. Um, I, I have to agree. And, and if I could award him his PhD today, I would do so. Um, you know, it, it, it is to me the quickest, most efficient way uh, to get to our nirvana. It, it, it truly is to me. I, I, and um, I, I don't know how else to answer it other than to say, um, that most of the agencies, I'm more familiar with the FCC. Um, uh, it is the expert agency, but it's been under-resourced. Let's just say it. It's oh, now Mignon, Are, isn't that a traditional construct of federal agencies that they are under -re I remember the chairman, you know, when you and I Which were at, we were the <laughs> chairman of the appropriations subcommittee one time told me in a hearing, because I want you to do less with less. Exactly. Um, and, um, and so my answer to the, the you know, the authors of, of the paper, why do you think uh, with a new agency that the mindset would be any different? So, Gene, you want to talk about um, digital DNA and the other challenges that agencies face, other agencies face? So, if I were um, a member of Congress and something like this were proposed to me, and I had um, the Federal Communications Commission coming in before me and said, no, 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 me, I can do this, and the Federal Trade Commission coming in before uh, me and saying the same thing, I would ask a series of questions. Where have you been? What have you done? And okay, let's go past the political leadership that's been on both, under both administrations. Let me bring in all the senior staff, show me your memos of what you would have liked to do that you didn't do. What studies you would have done that weren't allowed by the leadership. What proposals to Congress about updating the law, expanding authority, changing the law, uh, did you actually put to paper? You know, I would go through all of this. We have a, um, a series of hundreds of transactions involving the biggest dominant tech players, Google, Facebook, Amazon, and a few others. None of them challenge. We have investigations that led to nothing. We have workshops, we have a variety of things. We have nothing that even comes close to, to showing a record that the House Judiciary Committee put together in one year of the kinds of problems there are out there that need to be addressed. So I, I'll frame it that way. We don't see any digital DNA there. I, I'm, I'm happy again, if, this, if, if there are answers to these questions, if they can show the documents, they show they really were trying and just hadn't, it hadn't it'd been stifled by leadership, we need new leadership. But I have a feeling you know, it goes much deeper than that and we need to change that. So I'll just say this, even if you want an existing agency to do this, I think the best way to light a fire under them is to look at a new agency with new people and skills and say, show me how you're better. And, and what my compromise to you would be, what Tom always knows that I interrupt, so he's used to it. Um, you know, my, my not counter per se, but my parallel um, suggestion would be, I would love that type of, um, you know, looking in the mirror and, 
and, and, and, and voicing and espousing and, and all of that. I think that would be healthy um, for regulatory agencies. It would, uh, uh, with, without uh, any type of negative consequence. See, that's the issue um, there. You know, people, you know, we want this and ask for this, but then they're often, uh, you know, heck to be paid uh, if, if, if it's delivered. But if there's any way to set that up, that would be nirvana for okay. me because it's it, my uh, turn to interrupt. It's my yes, turn to okay. interrupt, Danielle. Awesome. Okay. So the difficulty is you take an agency like the FTC, Federal Trade Commission. Its responsibility literally is the entire economy. And 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 the challenges created by the digital environment. Um, deserve specific focus and not to be watered down or diluted by having a deal with the practices of funeral directors or McDonald's franchisees or the labeling of hockey pucks or dealing with robocalls, all of which are legitimate issues that the FTC has responsibility over. And, and the problem is that you develop a muscle memory of dealing with those kinds of issues that then keeps you from applying the resources necessary and having the, the statutory, judicial history giving you the tools to deal with these new generation of of, of issues. And I think that was the key to, to our thinking. I, I don't want to get into a, a back and forth here. Let me ask, let me, let me take a question here and, and direct it to Jason. This is from uh, Brigitte Hanley um, that says, the question is, Jason, the digital company operations are truly global in nature. And unlike traditional companies, it is difficult to segregate their operations country-wise. Given that other countries may also set up similar regulatory agencies and lead to complexities, how is the proposal going to deal with this challenge? You clearly address that right. for another country. Yeah, great. That's a really great question. You know, one could debate whether there should be some global regulator, um, but one debating that would be wasting one's time because that's not gonna happen. Um, I think what we can have happen though, is a certain amount of convergence in how this is dealt with um, in different countries. And that's what we already have in merger rules. If one multinational is merging with another multinational, that transaction needs to get cleared in lots of jurisdictions. There's not one worldwide merger clearance authority, but what it is, is the similar authorities, the authorities in different countries use similar rules. And so it's reasonably predictable that if you're going to clear in the United States, you're going to clear in the UK, Australia, and France as well. So I think that's what we need to have here is a certain amount of convergence that's similar and predictable across countries. I also think what we'll end up having is whoever has a regime that's both large, but also something that works well and is compliable with, you'll end up complying with that regime. And so you'll make your products and your practices compliant with the US regime, no matter where you operate in the world, or you'll make it compliant with the UK regime. And that will be sort of good enough to get you in compliance with all of them. Um, similarly to the way many companies now are complying with GDPR in the United States. It's just easier to do GDPR for the, the whole world than to do different things in different places. Um, what would be a disaster is if you had 170 different countries doing wildly different things. Um, but I think the constraint on that is that there would, uh, the countries wouldn't be able to do it. If you have a small country and have some Baroque set of rules, you're just going to get an incredibly stripped down version of Google in your country. Or maybe you won't even get Google. So I think there's a, the marketplace will place a constraint on having too much diversity and confusion come out of this. So Phil, you were the ambassador, our country's ambassador, for international um, uh, policy in this area. What are your thoughts on that question? And let me just, there, there, there are actually two other questions that tie in um, that, are, that are corollaries. 
Uh, Dimitri Martinez says, what are your views on global cooperation between regulators setting global rules of engagement for global com companies? And Jason just kind of addressed that. And then Dimitri Martinez says, or at least, or no, he, he comes back and says, or at least harmonization of regulations across borders. You had to live in that world, Mr. Ambassador. What are your thoughts? Well, um, first, uh, what Jason said is exactly right. Um, your uh, companies are going to end up <clears throat> trying to find a, a kind of anchor, a, a, a sort of center of gravity in terms of um, a regulatory regime in some administration and typically be some one of the more important larger countries. And uh, they'll adhere to that. Um, and then you have uh, what is a, a, an obligation both for public diplomacy by governments and also commercial diplomacy by companies but to try to see if they can't harmonize, can't, can't urge the harmonization of the regulations to the greatest extent possible. It, certainly, it is certainly true as we have more and more global companies and we have more and more efforts at uh, regulating um, major sources of interest, privacy being an obvious example. There are going to be at the margin some some differences that are going to be very, very hard to contend with. One of the consequences of that is the biggest companies will probably have a superior ability to contend with these things, and the smaller companies will find that these are, in fact, uh, very serious problems of barriers to entry or barriers to activity uh, in certain countries. So it's a really important issue, and um, it's one that uh, is well recognized, and there are people, we hope, of goodwill working on them, both from a governmental perspective and also from a commercial uh, perspective. So Michael Cadiz asks, arguably sector regulators like the Department of Agriculture, FDA, the Surface Transportation Board, and the Department of Transportation have done a poor job protecting competition. How do you design the digital regulatory agency to avoid that pitfall? Gene, you want to try that? Yes, you give them a specific mandate to promote competition and you give them specific tools to do it. And that's the whole point of the, the paper. Um, we have agencies that have done a poor job and have actually stood in the way of competition, as Michael points out. But we also have some examples of where uh, agencies work hand in hand, particularly with antitrust. Um, Phil started the, the launched the AT&T case, uh, I believe he said in 1974. Um, during the time it took to move that to litigation and then into, into settlement discussions, which I think he described as eight years, the Federal Communications Commission was moving forward with new um, uh, rules of the road for interconnecting networks for making sure that equipment could be plugged into the wall instead of having to be hardwired and equipment was more interoperable across the network, uh, developing rules for how a dominant transmission company could handle its value added services um, and establishing some structural limitations, much of which the court used in the breakup agreement, showing how a good pro-competitive regulatory framework goes hand in hand with antitrust. Um, and we've seen it in a number of merger reviews that, that, that um, uh, Chairman Wheeler, Commissioner Clyburn were, were involved in, where the FCC augmented what antitrust did. That's the kind of agency we need. I think that's the kind of direction you want from Congress. Um, not just replicating the past. We're moving away from the past. We're wanting to take the best examples from the past with common law principles and applying them with new digital frameworks. Jason, you were nodding your head on that. Yeah, I was nodding my head in agreement. Uh, Michael, look, that's a, a really important question to keep asking. Um, none of the examples you had had competition, as Gene said. In the UK, a number of the sector-specific regulators have a concurrent competition authority that they have been explicitly um, assigned. And my understanding is that works reasonably well there. Um, they do promote competition and that's because they've been told to do it. 
here it would be the central mission, not just a side, a side point, of course. So we've got a follow-up question um, from, uh, from um, Mr. Pataki that says, what can be said, this is, I guess Mignon, this is for you, what can be said to companies that say they can self-regulate better, especially with the dearth of subject matter act experts in the government? Um, I uh, say that we should be welcome uh, to all concepts and ideas. Um, we have to recognize, um, you know, in the current um, it, a state of economic being, um, our, our limitations. Uh, but we should not take any um, ideas or, 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 or concepts or agreements uh, that undermine um, our values and our, our responsibilities to consumers. Uh, is is great is. Uh, the personnel uh, that uh, we have at these agencies, you know, Gene has repeatedly said that, that this is not an indictment on them, but in, um, you know, a, a recognition that is a less than perfect construct. Um, they do not have all of the ideas and concepts, and there is such a thing as regulatory lag. So let me just, let's just be clear here. And there are places where, um, and opportunities uh, for uh, industry uh, engagement, engagement and agreements um, uh, can work in, in more real time, um, as well as uh, the proper levels of regulatory. Uh, I'll guess, you know, I'm not um, a, 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 an attorney, but um, ex ante uh, type of, because um, I don't hear that enough, to be honest with you. Um, uh, you, you know, I, I hear what happens after a harm is done. I, I, I see what happens when we don't have enough tools, um, but what about the ex ante, that, that type of, um, there are certain things we can see coming, certain things we can anticipate coming. Um, we cannot act on all of them in real time. So that type of uh, collaboration should not um, be discounted. And I think one of the challenges that with existing regulatory structure is that far too often it's ex post. Um, and, um, and it is targeted, particularly at the FTC. And again, I, I reiterate what, I, what you said, that these are good, dedicated people. The tools they have have constrained their capabilities, however. And, um, and an individual action uh, for a Section 5 violation deals with that company. Um, how do you deal with ex ante rules that cover an entire uh, um, uh, industry and, um, and and at least we thought that that meant that you needed to have an agency that was itself defined from the get-go that its job was competition and consumer protection of do in the area of dominant companies um, and and had the ability to have rulemakings but began with working with the industry to develop standards that then the agency enforces. Um, well, I see by the uh, alerts I'm getting uh, from Ali um, that we are coming to the end of this session. Um, uh, on behalf of all of those who were, had those great questions that they sent in uh, and all the others who were listening, Thank you to this distinguished uh, panel, um, Commissioner Clyburn, um, Chairman Furman, Ambassador Verveer, Jean Kimmelman. Uh, you know, one of the great joys that I had was the ability to, uh, to work together with people like, uh, like Phil and Jean and to learn from folks like Mignon, or like uh, Jason and Minion. Thank you for keeping us honest. And, and everybody who dialed in, thank you for joining us. Um, we hope you have a good day.